Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. We we worship you. We give you thanks. We praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God. You take away the sin of the world. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. God, your never-failing providence sets in order all things, both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those sins which we ought to have done. And we have done those sins which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises. Declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant the most merciful Father for his sake that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And hear now the comforting words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Well, we give thanks to God for that. Let us rise to sing in this assurance. We're so glad that you have come to worship with us at the Second Christian Reformed Church of Grand Haven, Michigan. 
Whether you are a member here or just passing through or here for the holiday weekend, listen to this welcome from the Lord Jesus Christ. To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares, to all who fail and desire strength, and to all who sin and need a Savior. This church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, ally of his enemies, defender of the guilty, justifier of the inexcusable, and friend of sinners. Welcome. Uh, in a few moments, uh, we will greet one another, but it seems like after a few weeks of absence, I almost need to reintroduce myself. Uh, my name is Tim Blackman. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm grateful for your prayers uh, for us and for our family the last few weeks. Obviously, at the beginning of the month, uh, I was, had the privilege of serving as a delegate to our synod, and I got to see all the ups and downs and the very careful and deliberate work of the Christian Reformed Church, and all of what happened there I hope to unpack with you at some point. And then straight from the floor of Synod, I went to a camp of 200 high school students in Northern California in Santa Cruz, and Betsy joined me, and our son Jonathan was a camper, and our daughter Jessica was a counselor. And those 200 high school students endured uh, what you endured for four months, the series on Joseph, they had in one week. Um, every morning and every evening, we opened the scriptures together, and uh, we are incredibly grateful for your prayers. Uh, today, as you noticed, uh, we are beginning a new series on the Psalms. This is why we're singing uh, new songs. We're obeying the scriptures, sing a new song. So I'm looking forward uh, to being uh, in the book of Psalms with you for the, the summer months. Let's take a few moments to welcome one another uh, to worship. children leave for walkout worship. I want to pray this prayer of blessing for our children, and we, I want you to, to pray not only for our own children, but also for all those who will come to Vacation Bible School uh, just uh, next week at the end of, uh, after next Sunday. Uh, so this is our prayer together. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we have put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. Let us never be put to shame. Amen. our Lord. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. 
For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The reign of the Lord's anointed. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell her the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you for this collection of books, the Psalms, uh, the songbook of the church. Lord, this is our playlist. We come to you now as we do so often with these words on our minds and we pray that these words would become alive to us. Speak to us through your spirit. And we pray that you would convict us of sin to help us to understand what our predicament is without you and how desperately we need Jesus Christ, the blessed and righteous man, in whose name we pray, amen. I have a vivid memory of a desperate phone call from one of my former parishioners. Her sister Mary had been declining rapidly and had been admitted to the ICU. Uh, Mary was terminal and I was told that it would be a matter of hours, not days. And would I please come now? Uh, unlike, Unlike her sister, as far as I knew, Uh, Mary was not a follower of Jesus and had not set foot in a church in a very long time. Uh, Since I had met her once at her house, I began my visit with a little small talk. And she was surprisingly peppy for someone who was terminal. Uh, She was even cracking pastor, priest, and rabbi jokes Uh, But without wasting much time, I asked her, "Uh, Mary, is it okay if I read some scripture with you and pray with you? And she said that it was. And then I asked her, what part would you like me to read? Is there a particular part of the Bible that you would like me to read? And Mary said, Psalm 23, would you please read Psalm 23. And so I I read it, uh, Mary listening reverently, and after I was done reading Psalm 23, I asked her, Mary, is there a particular reason why you wanted me to read this part? Why Psalm 23? And she looked at me and to my surprise said, I want you to read it because It means so much to me. He means so much to me. I was a bit taken aback. This is not what I had expected her to say. And so I I pressed in a little bit. I said, Mary, are you telling me that the Lord is your shepherd? Are you telling me that the Lord Jesus has been your shepherd? She nodded, yes. Are you telling me that, that he has been your Lord all along? 
And she, she nodded. Uh, we talked about that for a bit longer, but soon she began to fade. And I prayed with her, and then as the doctor came in to check on her, to see how she was doing, knowing that the time was short, I just launched into singing Amazing Grace. The doctor was there, her sister was there. And by the time we got to the many dangers, toils, or snares part, uh, Mary had breathed her last. What is it about the Psalms that make us reach for them at times like that? What is it about the Psalms? We go there for real help, for real people, for real life in real situations. Today we're starting a new summer series on the Psalms, and I'm using this title, Real Help for Real Life. Uh, in 1557, John Calvin wrote the preface to his commentary on the Psalms that he had written, and in the preface, Calvin says that the Psalms are an anatomy of the soul. I quote, for there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror, or rather the Holy Spirit has drawn to the life of all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distraction all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. In the Psalms, the, the highs are high and the lows are low. The lows are very low and the highs are very high. And all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men and women are wont to be agitated find their appropriate expression in these Psalms. And I hope that this short series will help you develop a lifelong love for the Psalms and will inspire you and equip you to pray them and sing them until the day that you die. Uh, tur turn with me to uh, right in the middle of your Bible. That is where uh, the Psalms usually are. They are the beating heart of the Scriptures, and it would be helpful if you keep Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 open. Uh, so you noticed I expanded the reading from just Psalm 1 to also include Psalm 2. I owe you an explanation for this. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing this initially, but after a careful reread, I think this is the best way. Hopefully, you'll agree in a few moments. As you, as you look at Psalm 1, you notice right away that neither Psalm 1 nor Psalm 2 have a superscription. The superscription is the little headline that provides information about the psalm's authorship, specific musical instructions or historical context or other relevant details, as you see that Psalm 3 and 4, for example, do have a superscription. And there's a simple reason for this, and you, you will see this by the end of our morning, that these two Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2, are themselves the heading. They are the superscription for the entire book of Psalms. They provide the relevant information that we need as we begin to live with and pray and sing all 150 Psalms. Psalm 1 and 2 are the introduction to the entire book of Psalms. Now what I want to do this morning, I want to show you these two Psalms side by side. Look with me right away at how Psalm 1 begins. Blessed is the man. In, in Hebrew, Asherah. And then look at the end of Psalm 2. Look at how Psalm 2 ends. Blessed are all who, and it's that same phrase, Asherah in Hebrew. 
So as an introduction to the Psalms, these two Psalms are bookended by blessing. The beginning of Psalm 1 and the end of Psalm 2 is marked by someone, by people experiencing the blessing or the redemptive presence of God in their lives. If you notice, in Psalm 1 begins by focusing on one blessed man as he navigates a world in which the wicked live. And Psalm 2 focuses on one king over against the wicked nations who are raging. It deals not so much with an individual as much as with the world of politics and governments, the interactions of kings and nations. You see in that Psalm 2, the nations and the kings appear in every one of the four stanzas. That psalm is concerned with the world of politics and history and the peoples and their governments. Look at the beginning of verse Psalm 1 again, verse 2. Uh, the righteous man meditates on the law of the Lord. Look at what it says in verse 2. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now the Hebrew word for meditate is haga, and to meditate, haga means uh, to murmur, uh, to speak repetitively to one's soul, uh, to mutter the words of God under your breath. When you are meditating, when you're doing haga, you fix your heart and mind on a particular truth of God's word and the reality of who he is, and you, you speak that word, you murmur that word, you whisper that word to your own soul until its truth and reality becomes clear and compelling for you to live by. That's what it means to do haga. And the righteous man does this all day, all night. Day and night, he's constantly chewing on it, murmuring. Now in Psalm 2, verse 1, we see that same word used. There is also someone meditating, but it is translated differently in English. Look in verse 1 of Psalm 2. We read there that the nations rage and the people's plot in vain. And the Hebrew word there is haga. The, the nations plot, the, they meditate and murmur, not on the word of God, but they meditate and murmur in their opposition and rebellion to the Lord. It's the same word in Hebrew. The nations are also muttering and murmuring. They are also constantly chewing on and preoccupied with something, not with the law of the Lord, but with finding ways to resist the work and word of God. Always breathing out resistance and disobedience under their breath. Look also how Psalm 1 begins. It begins with a, a group of people called the wicked. And look at what they are doing. They are walking, standing, and sitting. They seem active and on the go. They are on the move. They look like they are full of life. But if you follow their movement closely, the wicked go from walking to standing to sitting, so they are decelerating. They are coming to a halt. And here we see a beautiful illustration of a principle of reading the Psalms. And we pay attention to what the psalm is saying, and we pay attention, careful attention, to how the psalm is saying what it is saying. So the wicked seem active and lively, but they come to an abrupt halt. They come to a standstill. And they are standing, but ironically, they will not stand in the judgment their end and final destiny will come. They will hit a wall. And the psalmist then shows us what the righteous are like. And initially, the righteous one does not look nearly as dynamic, but he compares the righteous man to 
a standing tree, standing in one place. The tree is not on the go. It's transplanted by water. It has developed deep roots in one place. And the tree is able to withstand wind and, and weather and time and remains stable and fixed and steady. And it has a long and vibrant future. And, and notice how the psalmist uses three lines to describe how fruitful and strong and vibrant and alive the blessed person is. The description is, is rich and detailed. The tree yields its fruit in season and prospers. But again, notice not just what it's saying, but how it's saying what it's saying. The flourishing tree is described in a long sentence with three different parts. But the wicked are described very briefly. It just says, the wicked not. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. The chaff is gone like a single syllable. Poof, and it's gone. The, the sentence amounts to nothing because the chaff amounts to nothing. Chaff is useless. It's worthless. It's a waste product. And the psalmist doesn't give it the time of day. It is, it is so light, it is such vapid nothingness that the wind just, just picks it up and carries it away. In Psalm 2, you also notice that the wicked nations seem active and dynamic and busy with frenetic Energy. They are raging and plotting, but look at verse 9 of chapter 2. It shows that they too will be dashed to pieces, obliterated into the dust, just like the chaff. See, this is why they belong together. Let me show you something else. In Psalm 1, verse 1 says that the righteous man does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, the scoffers are those who laugh and poke fun at people who are consecrated to God, jeering at them, ridiculing at them, poking fun of them. But in Psalm chapter 2, verse 4, we read, He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derision, Yahweh is seated in, half, in heaven, and he is scoffing at the nations. So God is laughing and scoffing at the frantic plotting of the nations in rebellion. And the psalmist is saying he, he will have the last laugh. So... So in Psalm 1, you have the righteous one who draws life and strength and vitality from their delight in the law of the Lord. And in Psalm 2, it is written about a king. You notice he's describing the anointed one. In Hebrew, that word is Mashiach. In English, we say the Messiah. And he draws strength and stability from the decree of the Lord. Psalm 1, one righteous individual who loves God and his word perfectly. And Psalm 2, we read of the anointed Son of God in verse 1. Look in verse 7. There he's described as the begotten Son. And then in verse 12, worshipers are asked to kiss the Son. And just like the righteous man in Psalm 1 is confident of his future, in Psalm 2, the anointed one is assured, as we already sang this morning, that his rule will always expand and it will never end. It is an unshakable kingdom. In Psalm 1, future happiness is given to those who do not associate themselves with the wicked. They are not friends with the world. And in Psalm 2, future happiness belongs to those who are associated with and find refuge in the anointed Son of God. So they experience the blessing of God. They reap the benefits of the redemptive presence of God through the Son of God. And so now you see that these two psalms are meant to be read Together. Together they form an introduction to the entire Psalter. 
Now, I, I know it will take some time for us to adjust our eyes and ears to the imagery and the repetitions and the allusions and the language of the poetry of the Psalms. But for the sake of this morning, let's just, just pause with one, one simple but crucial takeaway. In Psalm 1 and 2, you will now have noticed there is a rhythm. There is a cadence, a pattern. And the rhythm is obvious, and it goes basically like this. The psalmist is saying, it's this, but it's not that. It's that, but it's not this. It's this, but not that. It's, it's that, but it's not this. And so Psalm 1 and 2 show us there are two ways to live. The, the structure, the movement, the vocabulary, and the imagery of the Psalms are working together to show that there are two ways to live and there should be no confusion about those two ways. It's this and not that. It's that and not this. The Psalms say that there are two kinds of people. Uh, there are two ways to live. There are two ideologies, two different belief systems, two different set of assumptions about reality. There's this and there's not this. There is the city of God and there is the city of man. There are two spiritual realities in which we live. There are two eternal destinies. Psalm 1 and two show us that it is, it is either this or that. It's either that or this. You are either that or you are either this. You are either meditating on the Word of God, you are murmuring on it, you are speaking to your soul about how you long to receive life from God, or you're not. Uh, you are going to, to live by it and with it, day and night, life's energies given to doing life with God, you either do that or you don't do it. You are either going to stand in the judgment or you are not going to stand in the judgment. In these Psalms, there is the congregation of the righteous who has been transplanted for eternal flourishing. And then there are the nations, busy and, and frantic. But they're sinners and they will come to a screeching halt. There are those who, who worship the Son, the Anointed One, and enjoy the blessings of His redemptive presence. There are those who kiss the Son in worship with their lives. And there are those who do not. Now these Two psalms, if, if you haven't noticed, uh, offer us uh, little by way of nuance. They do not offer us a third way. There is no casual middle ground. No one can serve two masters. There are two realities. There are two spiritual realities. There are only two ways to live. Now, I, I, know, I know what some of you are thinking. Uh, clearly, our pastor is jet-lagged. Uh, he's in need of some vacation. He sounds stressed and punchy. He needs to go to the conference grounds. I see he has his bracelet on already. He's headed there this afternoon. He needs a break. Clearly, he's a little too dogmatic about it all. Some of you are thinking about, how, what do you mean there's only two kinds of people, because, because you, you work with a lady. There's a lady at your work, and she, she comes to work every day, and she's on time. She doesn't steal paper clips from work, and she, uh, she fulfills her duties as assigned. She manages her team uh, well, and she pays her taxes on time. She is a, she's a good person, and she's kind. And pastor, are you telling me that just because she doesn't kiss the sun just because she doesn't worship Jesus. Does it mean that she is foaming at the mouth with rebellious thoughts against Christ and his kingdom? Is, is that what you're telling me? I mean, are you telling me that she is 
wicked and lost? I mean, why so, why so black and white? Why not a little bit more nuance? Why not a little bit more complexity? People are just not either this or that. It all sounds so absolutist. And I know that that language of judgment, it sends the shivers up the spine of postmodern folks in a secular world. It all sounds so so jarring and, and certainly not very politically correct. Uh, let, let me show you something. You have your Bibles open still. Uh, go with me on one quick little jaunt to the book of Acts and turn with me there to the fourth chapter. I could give you more examples of this, but I will give you just one example in the interest of time from the book of Acts since we have been reading the book of Acts this last month. And turn with me to Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Uh, Peter and John have just been released from prison. The early church is gathered for prayer. Uh, They are intimidated. They are overwhelmed. They are afraid of the opposition they are facing. And they are looking for real help for real life. And as they are praying, they quote Psalm 2. Look at it with me for a moment. Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 27. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit in Psalm 2, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So during their community prayer, the apostles give us the official interpretation of Psalm 1 and 2. So these first followers of Jesus, they knew this psalm and they applied it directly to the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that it was him who was the anointed one of whom David prophesied by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the resistance that they faced was not really just the resistance of the Romans and the Jewish leaders, but it was fundamentally the resistance of the wicked, the scoffers, the nations who were murmuring their rebellion against the Lord and his King Jesus. And so by, by quoting Psalm 2, They were saying by faith that that rebellion and that the resistance that they were facing was actually rebellion against Jesus the King. And they knew by faith that all this resistance one day and perhaps soon would come to a screeching halt. So we see that the dividing line between human beings is not... Uh, Are you a law-abiding citizen or are you not? Are you a criminal or are you not? Are you a tax evader or a taxpayer? Uh, Are you kind or are you rude? Are you civilized or uncivilized? Are you nice or not? That, That is not the primary question. Nor is the primary question, did you grow up in a religious home or were you raised in an irreligious manner? Now, of course, we would prefer to work with people who fit the, the former category rather than the latter. We prefer to have neighbors who mow their lawn and have clean edges. But the dividing line for humanity, as far as the Scriptures is concerned, is, is completely different. The, def- the, the dividing line, the question is, will you kiss the sun? Will you worship the anointed one? 
Will you worship with your entire life the anointed Messiah, Jesus the King? This or that? Will you actively devote your life to Christ and his coming kingdom, or will you give your life to something else? This is the question. Will you live under the redemptive presence, the blessing of the living Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit or not? And in doing so, Psalm 1 and 2 give us a picture of the good life. Now, the person living the good life is the person for whom the good news of Jesus Christ is the telling influence of their lives. Happy is the person who hangs on every word that comes from the lips of God. Happy is the person who receives the grace and healing presence of God in his son, Jesus Christ. Those are the happy ones. Happy are the ones who can stand in the judgment. Can you stand in the judgment? Oh, as prophet Malachi says, who can stand when he appears? I know I can't, but I know that he can. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, at the time that is appointed to him, he will come from heaven. And as we confess nearly every week, and we will do in a few moments, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And the Son of God is the only one who truly fits the description of Psalm 1. He's the only one who has loved God perfectly. He's the only one who meditates on his word day and night. He's the only one who has given his entire eternal life so that we could have life and flourish. And that is true for all those who put their faith and trust in him. Uh, I, I don't know if the authors of the Heidelberg Catechism were thinking of Psalm 1 when they wrote question and answer 52. But listen to these words. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead? And here is the answer. That in all my sorrows and persecutions, with uplifted head, I look for the very one who offered himself for me to the judgment of God and removed all the curse from me to come as judge from heaven and he will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into the joy and glory of heaven. And so here in Psalm 1 and 2 we get Real help for real life. Not just because there are some glib tips and techniques about how to get the most out of life. No, the wonderful invitation is this and not that. And may you experience even now the blessing, the life, the redemptive presence through Jesus Christ, the Son. Worship him. Kiss him. This is the invitation that it is through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and it can be yours forever. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we find here real real help for real life in the midst of all the confusion of our world and in the midst of what seems to be all these divisions. Your word cuts through the noise with matters of life and death, with matters of heaven and hell, with judgment sitting and standing in it. And we thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ has taken upon himself the judgment of Almighty God and that we now, by faith in him, can have everlasting life. 
What a gift. What good news. What good news for tired sinners. What good news for folks who wander. Help us to believe it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. church of all times and all places, we confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father of all might. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Please pray with me. Father God, as our country's Independence Day holiday approaches, <clears throat> we are grateful for the freedom and abundance with which you have blessed this land. But remind us, Lord, that we stand only because of your hand and discretion. May we not take our privileges and benefits for granted, but instead be prayerful and educated in our duties as citizens, such as selecting leadership, supporting causes, and caring for those in need. Although we celebrate independence, we embrace that above all else, it is our dependence on you that gives true and complete freedom. You alone have a flawless plan for each of our lives. Let us not look side to side, but rather upward to the ultimate leader, our Father in heaven. Lord, we are thankful for Pastor Tim's and his family's safe return. 
We are grateful for the time he has been able to spend with the young people at the Ponderosa Lodge to share his insight and devotion to you and your word, just as he does with us every Sunday. Please continue to bless his ministry here in your world and strengthen and encourage him, as well as Betsy and their family. Father, we are thankful for those who have responded to your call to counsel and church leadership. Help us to pray for them in the tasks and decisions they must undertake to keep our church on course, such as the completed budget for the year and filling recent staff openings. We also ask that you bless their decision to support one of our own, Ben Vierink, and his ministry in Columbia. May our support of Ben bring blessings to those he serves. And Lord, this morning we're grateful for the talents and work of Paul Lemaire over these last several years as he steps down as our worship coordinator. Paul's faithful service has enhanced our worship and lifted your word high. Lord, we are grateful for the healing you have provided to those in our church family, healing for those experiencing energy or, excuse me, injury or illness, undergoing surgery, and wading through the journey of grief. We praise you for unhooking us so successful back injury and ask that she is granted full recovery. Please continue to strengthen Carol Ryder, Ruth Svant, and Carol Brower as they continue their ongoing rehabilitation and recovery. We ask that you provide healing for Sharon Yonker after her knee surgery this week, and we are thankful that Barb Brummel's long-awaited eye surgery has been completed and pray she will experience a good outcome. Please hold those close that are grieving the loss of loved ones, the Vontem family, Ione Hookinga and the Baker family, and the Zaitama family. Lord, provide times of respite for them as they travel this road of transition to a life without those that have left us. When they feel unable to move on, please provide your comfort and grace for the moment until they can carry on. And we ask that you reveal to us the needs of others in our congregation so that we may be your hands in their time of need. Lord, this morning we heard your word from the book of Psalms. In another part of that same book, it is said that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light on our path. As we move through this upcoming week, help us to recall those words when this world throws snares and roadblocks before us. We ask you to equip us not only to follow the path that you will show us, but to use that same light to illuminate that from which we should turn away and enable us to live out the words of the prayer that you graciously provided. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Pastor Tim, good to have you and Betsy back. With you gone, it gave us a brief glimpse of when we were vacant, thankfully brief, but that was a time where Paul Lemaire stepped up to work for us, and we want to recognize that he is passing the baton on that uh, role and responsibility for us. One of the many things I've learned about church since being in council is the vast array of activities that take place to operate our church. And the faithful volunteers and employees that expertly perform them. Take worship, for example. Every song, liturgical element, special music, and prayer is carefully planned and composed, rehearsed, perfected, and coordinated I think excellence in worship is one of the hallmarks of our church, and it's essential to how we praise God. And so today we want to recognize someone who played a key role in that worship planning, and that's you, Paul. Paul coordinates the pianist, the organist, the vocalist for the praise team every week. He ensures that the music is prepared for all the worship leaders on Sunday mornings. Paul took care of paying the instrumentalists as required and even checks over the slides for Sunday projection 
to make sure they match the liturgy. And just like Paul, he performs all those tasks with little notoriety, no fanfare, faithfully and expertly each week. So today, Paul, as you pass that baton on those responsibilities, on behalf of the council and the members of Second, thank you so much for your service. I sent an email out to people that I wanted to thank, and I think it was like 45 people, singers, the other musicians, um, people willing to give the prayer every week, uh, all the guys in the back, and I apologize if you didn't get that email and I missed your name because I went through the list, so I thought, what a testament to, to our church that so many people are willing to just step up and do something when they're asked. Very seldom do you get a no. Something, well, I'm out of town, okay, well, maybe next week, you know, that kind of a thing. So just thank you to all of you, too, for, for helping out, supporting, and I'm sure going forward, you know, I quoted a song, through the church the song goes on, and it, and it will. So, and we're going to sing a new song now for the offertory. It's a, it's, it's Psalm 1, sort of, okay. It's kind of Spanish, has a little rhythm. I think we'll get into it, have a good time, so... Let's go.
so glad that you've come to worship today. I hope that you stay around for coffee and refreshments. If you see about 50 people who have an uncanny resemblance to my wife, uh, it's their family, uh, welcome them warmly. But now receive God's blessing. God, go before you to lead you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to sustain you. And God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid, but may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you always. Do not be afraid, but go in peace. Amen.